um, open the meeting then, um, if everybody's okay. Can all the people online hear? Can you hear Nicole? Oh, James can hear anyway. Lan can hear. It's great. Thanks very much. Right, welcome to the 550th meeting of the Canterbury Regional Council. Uh, it's still a very interesting period of the pandemic that we're in, and we're all having to cope across New Zealand um, with wearing masks where possible. We've, a number of delegates have just come back from the local government New Zealand conference, where we had around 500 uh, delegates attending, and everybody was very diligent wearing their masks, so that's excellent. So um, we've got a rather interesting meeting today, uh, and with a deputation coming uh, shortly, um, who is going to be online, uh, that's Mr Ian Mertens. He's going to be talking to us about the silo situation. What's that? Martin Mertens. Um, and um, yesterday we did something very significant. We opened the heritage building next door that we acquired in the public good as part of our local government well-beings under the Local Government Act. Uh, it's very exciting to be able to contribute to the history and heritage and the well-being of the Christchurch community by um, being able to make sure a building has been protected rather than going to the landfill because a lot, rather a lot went to the landfill during the earthquakes and it's been some time since the containers were able to be removed. So there's still four or five containers outside the other property that we own, so we'll be working on getting rid of that in the next year or so, I suspect. So I'd like to invite Tumu Taya Yay and Cranwell to um, uh, open the meetings with a mihi Fokato and Yayan will also be um, giving us a karaki. So over to you, Yayan. <laughs> Bauri ora, ko te mea tua tai ki, ki te rukarawa, no nā te timataka, no nā te whakamitanga. Kaore inu o anō hoki, nā nā tātou katoa manaki te aki ke wā katoa. Ka huri au kia rātou ko he, wehi atu ki te pō, moi mai rā, moi mai rā hoki o ki mai. Kia rātou ko takahia te arawhanu i o tāne, whakatā, whakatā, whakatā i tēnei wā, kaore mātou i wariwari tia i o koutou ko wheturaki tia i tēnei wā. Moi mai rā, moi mai rā hoki o ki mai, tīraha, whakatā. A te noa tātai hono, te pito mate, ki te pito mate, a te noa tātai hono, te pito ora, ki te pito ora, nō reta tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tatu katoa nau mai haru mai ki tēnei hui. Rima rau, rima te kau, mō tēnei kaunihera, mō tēnei kaunere tēnei wā. Nei anō te mihi ki a koutou ngā kai kaunihera, a kai mahi, O te, o te wahi nei, nei o nō te mihi ki au kutu katoa. E tū au mi atu ki a uh, Martin Mertens, i hara mai i tēnei, i tēnei wā ki te kōrero ki a, ki a tatu katoa i apana te mahi i te tāho ngā awa. A hoki i tēnei rā hei whakanuia i a Ian, Ian Hislop mō, uh, mō tōna mahi um, mō te kaunere tai au ki waitaha. Kore rōrō rō te kōrero nei, ingari huri noa, huri noa, tēnā kutu, tēnā kutu a tēnā tata katoa. Ai tākana te karakia nei, hai a te aua. Oi o te aua, wahi o te aua, puti i tua, puti i waho. O te pake au te rākau o maere nuku, o maere raki, o maere te maro whenua e. I ruka tāne, i raro tāne, paku paku o tāne, te raki i o tāne. No hoaka, o te āreki hoatu e tāne ki uta. Tūturu fiti whakamaua ki a tūna. Uh, thank you, Tumu Taia Yan Cranwell. Uh, indeed, um, in his Amihi Fokato, uh, Ian said something I should have also uh, Yan said something I should have also said that uh, we're going to welcome Ian his lot, a past um, engineer that's worked extensively on the rivers in Canterbury. He will be coming to the meeting at twelve thirty. So thank you, Yayan. There's apologies. Um, we've got Councillor Megan Hands, and I believe we've also got an apology for part of the meeting uh, from Councillor Vicky Southworth and Tumu Taya 
uh, Yvette, uh, Couch Lewis. Um, who else have we got? Any other apologies? Um, no, that's it. Thank you. There's no changes in the conflicts of interest that I've been advised of. And as we said, um, we will be having our Martin Mertens. I think Martin has just um, come, been led into the meeting. So welcome to Martin. Uh, yeah. Uh, we've got your presentation and we can look after you. Uh, but anyway, yeah. you've got 10 minutes to talk. And, yes, thank um, you. Yeah, just try and not go too much over 10 minutes and then we might ask you some questions. And after yes. that, we pass a resolution to accept what you've said and we ask the CE to have a look into that and we'll write you back a letter in relation yes. to it. So we have to pass a resolution about that. But anyway, over yes. to you. So if you, you you want to start speaking now, uh, we still can't see you, but um, uh, yes, I, just, uh, I don't know. Uh, just yeah, start any... going, and we've got your slides up there by the look of it. If that's, that's right, isn't it, Christina? So we've got the slides um, going. So yeah. if you want okay, to start, it'll be good. Thank yes, you. Yes, no, you can. You, so it's about silage leachate. Yeah. And um, this is a liquid from a silage stack. And so if we move on, I've, I've been well immersed in the rural industry. Uh, the next, you know, the next slide, my background, if you go to my background. Yes, we can see that. Yes, um, I've yeah, been, you know, involved in farming, brought up in farm. I've actually been farming, but I've been servicing farm machinery for 46 years. So I get to see a lot of farms. And um, so why this, why I brought this about is, um, I read in the English Farmers Weekly, which I get, and I presume, have you got a copy with you for the meeting? Did a copy turn up? Yes, we uh, have got a copy. Yes, well, that's the sort of um, thing. Anyway, um, the so that I read in that that a drop of this leachate in a glass of water will deform a baby in the womb. That is why... I am raising this matter. And there was a recent matter that jogged my memory. And this is about the fourth time I have talked to ECAN people about this. And it seems to be going nowhere and people don't understand how important. So um, for some reason, I've deleted slide three. I've got another laptop with the slides on it. So I'm, can you tell me what slide three is, please? Just... Um, uh, well, according it's a, to me, slide three is the one we've got up now, which is yeah, well, leachate. What is it? That's the one yeah, we've got. It, well, it, it's 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 a really high. It's the highest form of nitrate poisoning to human beings, and um, it it'll kill the grass where it leaks, and um, it'll be it, like it's very like. I think a kilogram of the artificial nitrogen um, urea, you know, called urea, pot like polystyrene balls, it's 46%. But we think this silage leachate stack is somewhere between 60 to 65%. So it's very um, poisonous. Now, um, we'll move on to the next um, Slide four, slide four, yeah, silage leachate, what is it? So you can see a picture of a silage stack with the liquid running out of it. Um, that's the, but what, probably what you've got to understand is they have huge amounts made. Um, yeah, no, and there I can see it. Huge amounts made. Um, can you hear me still? Yes, we can hear you, and we. Oh, can that's see good. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Um, we can we can uh, huge amounts are made. So grass from a hundred, two hundred, three hundred hectares could be all put in one big pile, one big stack, or two stacks. Um, I heard the Ashburton feedlot, for example, had ten thousand tons there. So that's a lot of grass. Um, and um, so this is really what I want to um, – uh, one of the things probably not realised is that it removes the – so this is from an American thing. Um, one gallon can deplete um, – one gallon can deplete a 
the oxygen, remove the oxygen from 100,000 gallons of water. So you could have fish deaths, unexplained fish deaths. And one of the things that I've sort of been thinking, like a lot of silage stacks are around um, waterways, riverbeds, because of the natural depression in the ground. They say, oh, that's a handy spot to put a silage stack. So that's where it ends up. So that's one of the things that ECAN will have to do an aerial view of all the silage stacks around. Are they well away from waterways? Um, you know, in the UK and Europe, you get prosecuted if you allow um, silage leachate to, you don't contain it. You've got to contain it, uh, dilute it, and spray it back onto pasture. So next slide. Um, why is it a problem now? Well, we've got a, um, yeah, why is it a problem now? Oh, yeah, perhaps you go on to, yeah. Uh, we've got a more intensive, uh, well, the dairy farming won't increase, but it's been more intense. It's been gradually changing 20, 25 years. Um, cows have a huge, eat, you know, consume a huge amount of grass. And silage is fed to cows to keep production at the start of the season and at the end of the season. It's probably the only industry that can actually feed. Um, I guess the sheep milking will be the same way, but not the same big volumes. Um, but this is, you know, and there's quite a few cows indoors year round in New Zealand. I don't think people realise that. Not everyone's outside. It, and it could be an overlooked major driver of nitrate pollution. Um, that's, you know, I think it's underestimated. I don't think, if you asked a whole lot of people involved in the industry here in Canterbury, some might say, oh, yes, yeah, not good. But for a lot, um, it will be... Um, you know, they won't realise just the ramifications behind it. And one of the problems we're seeing is contractors have got high price machines, the pressure's on financially, the weather's against them. Um, in that Farmers Weekly, there was a advertising thing for farm machinery for harvesting grass, you know, a mower, rake, tedder, baler, and they're all in the same paddock at the same time. They're not allowing the grass to wilt properly. And when you don't allow it to wilt properly, uh, it will produce more of this liquid, silage leachate liquid. And this is where you get the problems because it's all rushed, it's all in a hurry. Um, environment Southland, for example, say you can't uh, put it in a stack until it's, or start harvesting the grass until it's under 32% dry matter. So this is really important, really important that it's all about education and understanding rather than a big stick and bringing about change voluntary rather than a big stick. This is what I want more than ever. I think the really big thing to understand, and I'm sure the Greens don't understand it, but rural New Zealand, in COVID has, and up till Christmas, has been earning 83% of the nation's income. 40% of that 83 is um, the dairy industry alone. That's why Professor Keith Woodford said, who's, who's in Christchurch there, that's why he said the dairy industry is so important to New Zealand. So we just have to be better at our job you know, do these things voluntary, do them in front, you know, see where we need to change, see where we need to do things better so we can say honestly on the world stage that we are squeaky clean. So we can move to the next um, slide, please. Yeah, what I see making silage, well, I've just said about being rushed, made in a hurry, too wet. Um, the silage machine, you quite often see the mowers in one pack and then a couple of hours later, the silage machine with a big baler. Um, the other thing to add is 
you don't just have fine chop like a silage chopper. You can have a big square baler putting baled silage in a big stack and um, same thing, same um, problem if it's made too soon. The balers, machines will handle it. They'll chop it through. They've got incredible horsepower. But um, And some people do want wetter silage. Some farmers do want wetter silage than others. And like I do my own, I do baling and uh, baleage. Um, and I like to take my time about it, making it, you know, it's about making it in time. But of course, the guys with the young guys, especially high price machine, finance, incredible financial drivers, especially last season was so wet. Um, they want to get the numbers through. It's happening, you know, and it'll take a lot to deter them. So we can move on to our next uh, slide, please. Next. So what I see after storage, here it is. There's a good picture, really a lot of liquid. And a lot of them are close to waterways. Now, when I first contacted ECAN, I remember leachate running down a hill to by a bridge and going into a river. And the question is, does that stay in the ground? Does it dilute? Um, does it take quite a while to dissipate? We don't know. So, you know, there are those things that we need to, um, you know, research, find out. But you, I think you'll find there's a lot of silage pits, a lot of stacking of bales by waterways. And quite often where there's big floods, just like we've had a lot of rain recently, um, you'll find that... They, you know, people, they can lose the silage um, into the waterways. So there's a confirmation that they're around. Um, but that's one of the things. And if you see, you know, you see individually wrapped bales or baleage in a tube line and you see the, the sacking, sagging or the tipping over, you know, the individual wrapped bales, so you know it's been made too soon. Um, yes, yeah, so we can turn to the next um, next slide, please. So I read a lot of um, farming literature, especially international, and I also see a lot of programs on TV. Um, I think it's quite a widespread problem. Yeah, I definitely think the people are not aware that should be. Um, and I don't think ECAN's aware of the problem. And, you know, we need education, we need um, closer monitoring, and we need regulation and consequences and not consents as they um, get draconian. But we just need to know if you're going to, I've got um, clients, for example, I've got a big silage stack. Um, I know it costs, the concrete bunkers cost 300,000, so they're not small but there's no drains. So the company that built those, um, they need to know that they have to put drains. And just reading up some of the information, you can't have a sealed container holding this liquid, otherwise hydrogen sulfide gas results, and that's very poisonous. And um, it needs to be an open container. Obviously it doesn't, um, uh, you know, can't will be partially open. I wouldn't think you'd want too much rainwater getting in. The other, I notice in the UK and some Southland properties that they do have covered silage um, pits, you know, got an actual roof over them too, so stopping rainwater. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm asking ECAN is prevention by raising awareness. You know, it's the people who chop and bail, um, there's a rural contractor magazine, that'd be one way of reaching them. Um, you need to probably put it in local ho rural hotels. Um, from e uh, For ECAN, especially for ECAN, to be fully aware from top to bottom. Um, we need aerial survey of silage pits. We need agricultural Financial institutions, they need to be on board too because um, 
they, uh, you know, if they didn't sell the machine, well, they wouldn't be making the problem happen. Um, machinery dealers, um, they are just as much. Um, there's a real onus in the Europe in the UK. There's usually a sticker on our drawbar of a big implement of some sort. It'll say, have you signed a declaration? That means you understand how the machine works, how it operates, and about all the health and safety matters with it. Um, the plastic wrap dealers, the ones who sell silage covers, um, we need to put in local newsletters in each rural community, and especially through rural women's networks. And when you see, you know, when I saw that British report, it just said one drop of leachate in a glass of water will uh, deform a baby in the womb. That is the bottom line. And of course, we also know that the nitrates building up in our rivers, our waterways, or you know, our uh, water aquifers deep down, and this is maybe one thing that we can do to minimise its impact. So, um, so what? And um, next slide, please. So, what ECAN needs to do provide guidance on silage pit design and placement, ask government for silage pit regulations in the new legislation, more monitoring of silage. You don't know if it's a problem if you're not monitoring. Ensure there are consequences for bad leachate management. Um, subscribe to the UK Farmers Weekly magazine for councillors, staff and all branches. Um, you want to partner with Lincoln University to ensure new graduates are aware of risks. So it's built in and maybe already you've done so. I mean, my, one of my sons, I asked him and he understood. He, he knew what it's about. Um, so there it is. So, you know, silage is made, it, it's like money in the bank. Um, it, and well-made and stored silage is money in the bank and protects the environment. Silage leachate can be diluted and used as a fertiliser. So it's the highest form. So hopefully you can hear that and that, take that on board and go from there. Thank you very much. That was very good timing. So thank you for that. And thank you for the excellent slides. Have we got any councillors that would like to ask a question? First of all, Councillor Claire Mackay. Thank you, Martin, um, for your deputation. Um, in the um, interest of transparency, I'm a dairy farmer who makes some silage with three stacks on our property. Um, and I agree with you that there are some responsibilities, uh, particularly from the contractors and um, side of doing the work, because most of us probably use a contractor um, particularly if, if you've got a substantial size farm. Um, I have a question. Are you aware of the farm environmental plans that something like 3,000 of our farmers across Canterbury have out of roughly 8,000 um, that may uh, you know, be in agriculture? Um, and the auditing requirements that go with them because, you know, we they, we look very closely at the environmental impacts from such things as silage, uh, leachate, and drainage. Okay, well I'm I'm not entirely clear on that. Um, the thing I would say is that I've just asked different ones randomly what they know about silage leachate and they don't know. They may be it may be more of awareness. Then I'm I'm aware, but I I think it really needs. I was just staggered. This big um, concrete bunkers weren't built with drains, and in fact, one of the farmers who owns it, he went away and got a sheep trough to put to try and catch the liquid. I don't think they know how poisonous it is in the wrong place. Um, I'm just, it's really about education and understanding. 
you know, and and I just want to see people do a good job, you know, a really good job, not a um, – and really understand about this. And it just that incident in um, – to do one of the rivers inland to Maru was um, jogged my memory to say, well, you know, I've raced this before and um, – It'd be interesting to go and visit one of the farms, one of the big, or three farms, two big milking ones that sold recently, um, just to see how they said in the paper they were above the environmental regulations. And it'd be interesting to see, do they catch the liquid, for example? Um, because Martin, I'm not... Um, I think it might be good if you don't mention any specific farms. So we're just um, yeah, a bit concerned okay. about that. So that'd be good if you did that. Yeah, no, that's I fine. Well, I just wanted to... That, that's a good answer, though. And then Claire, which, Councillor Claire would just like to make a comment back. So we'll just let her do that. And then I've got a couple yep. of other questions for you. Claire? Thank you. Thank you, um, Martin. Um, I know that from our farm, uh, personally... On our farm, I've got denitrification pits which catch any drainage, should there be drainage. We don't have drainage uh, when we put the silage in, but you tend to get drainage from the silage that's actually left on the bottom of your concrete pads at the end of the season or during it. So that, that yeah. also is an issue. But denitrification pits are working pretty well and they're pretty easy to put in. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank that, you. That's good. Yes, well, that's good. Thank you, Councillor um, Mackay. We'll just go to the other questions now, Martin. So we've got a councillor, yes. Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie's got a question. So, yeah. Oh, hi, Martin. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yep. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, can just to sort of give an idea of the scale of the problem. So could you estimate sort of like, how frequently or how many times, say, per annum, have you actually seen leachate draining into waterways? Well, I've seen silage pits put in precarious, what I'd call precarious places. I mean, I know why it's done, but I've seen leachate leaking and it's... It should be of a concern. I, I would say perhaps the people down in this area aren't as well aware as where Councillor Clare places. I'd be interested to know, but I have asked a lot of young, different ones, Do they under, what do they know about it? And they don't seem to know, and that's my, my concern. And the fact I've raised it with ECAN and I haven't been... I've had to look at environmental environment Waikato and environment Southland to get um, you know to get to see uh, what their regulations are, and they seem to be quite good. So thank you, Martin. Um, we'll just see if Elizabeth's got another question, then we can move on to count. Yeah. You didn't really quite answer the question, Martin. I was trying to get an idea of um, sort of how many times. So do you, do you sort of see this um, just at a certain time of year and, you know, once a week or um, would you say well, every farm or, or every second farm or, you know, just want to get an idea? Of well, scale. put it this way, I, I would think it would have to be every second farm you get to go on and silage has just been made, especially – start of the season where it's very lush, um, they're wanting to get numbers on the board and it's done. Very hard to get um, silage grass to wilt properly at the start of the season. Um, yeah, from October to November onwards, you would, you would see it. It would be something you would see I don't know if I'd say regular, but you would see it. You've got to know to look for it. I think that's the big thing. You've got to know to look for it. Oh, well, and... Thank you very much. Um, did you have any other questions, Councillor? Okay, Councillor Phil Clearwood has got. A, would like to say something, um, Martin. He'll be. Oh, no, thank you, Chair, but I think my question has been asked. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, all okay. right. So that's good. Thank you. Now we have Councillor Craig Pauling. Hey, um, yeah. thank, thanks, Martin, uh, for your great deputation and 
really well thought out, and thanks for giving us lots of ideas about what we could do. Um, my questions about that in terms of the Environment Southland and the uh, Environment Waikato um, information and what they've got. Um, I mean, at the very least, do you think that's if we did something like they do, would that be a good step in the right direction? Oh, I I think so. I think that would be good. I think you've also got to remember um, Canterbury River systems are braided rivers, so a lot of shingle areas and a lot of these silage bits will be in these shingle areas and will be, be, be um, very porous, the ground. Um, that's an important note. So they need to be well away from riverbeds um, just to be sure because they'll get down into the aquifers and we do know there's been unexplained fish deaths. Um, you might see, oh, this uh, might be a thing in the paper to say, oh, some fish have died and they don't know why. Well, that may be the reason. You wouldn't know. So, but, um, well, well yeah. thank you. Um, I think that's answered your question, Councillor Pauling. Did you have another question? Anybody else got a question? Oh, Councillor Ian McKenzie has a question. So, so just to be clear on that point, Martin, have you read the rules in our national uh, NRP plan around silage and silage tax? I, to be honest, I haven't read the rules, but I'm interested in the practical part where do all the young people operating the silage machinery, making silage, dairy farming, and that do they all understand? The ramifications of creating this silage leachate. I mean, you can have all the written literature, but you've got to know that it's got into people's brains, and they know that what the rules are. I think that's, and that's why I said initially, this is all about education and making a major awareness. I mean, why is why is the UK and Europe? prosecuting farmers for this leachate to get out. Yeah, if it's not captured, you know, they're quite tough on them there. So um, that's where I'd answer that. The follow up. Thank you, Martin. Um, Janice, turn it off. Somebody's putting the radio on. I'm at your place. That's it. Good on you. No, that's right. Okay, um, Martin, you understand presumably do you, that if we have rules around uh, the appropriate siting and uh, design of silage pits, which we do in our NRP, then those farmers who uh, break those rules will be uh, uh, guilty of non-compliance and prosecuted, or 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 uh, which follows exactly what's happening in Europe, effectively. And, uh, and as, as I understand it, I don't think ECAN's rules are any different to uh, any of the other regional councils in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah so I, um, I mean, I think the thing is you, you might have all the legislation, the rules there now, but the question is to go out and find, to check farms and see that they are complying and then have a big education um, thing to make sure that everybody's meeting because there are different, um, you quite often see a what they call a bun, a pit silage that's just on level ground. Um, you can see silage put in a hollow, like down on, on a riverbed somewhere, because it's shingle, uh, good access for big heavy machinery. Um, you've, you've just got to check it out to see that what you've got as rules meet. And um, I would have thought, New Zealand would have just had nationwide rules with some exceptions like the braided rivers in Canterbury with the shingle beds around. Um, I know environments Southland are quite clear on keeping it well away from, you know, porous. It, there's got to be impervious is their wording. I don't know if use of big words like that are, they've got to be clear. So the simplest of people can understand them. Um, that's, you know, it's something to think about. All right. Well, okay. um, I don't think we've got any other uh, questions that I can see. Uh, so thank you very much for that excellent presentation you did. 
I think yes. you explained it really well and you've sent in some slides, so we really appreciate all the work you've gone and done for us and you've got some yep. practical outcomes. So what we'll do now is we'll pass a resolution and if you can just stay online for a minute and then we'll get back to you with a letter that we'll write. So we're going thank to you. move, move – so thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, yes, we're please. moving a resolution that the Council receives the public forum from Martin Mertens regarding – um, regarding uh, silage pit placement near waterways and its implications. Um, and number two, uh, we provide a reply to Martin Mertens as soon as practicable. Um, I'll move that from the chair. Have I got a second? A second oh, by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Actually, if you want to move it, do you, Elizabeth? But moved by Elizabeth McKenzie and seconded by Councillor Craig Pauling, because as I said that, people put their hands up, so I was going a bit fast, sorry. Uh, so it's moved by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie and seconded by Councillor Craig Pauling. All those in favour, please say aye. Is there anybody against? Uh, that's carried. Thank you very much, and thank you, Martin. If you can uh, either stay online or go off now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for that, radio. Yes, Thanks. thank you. Bye. Yes. Cherry. Right. Um, if we can just have that full wording in that resolution, if you don't mind, please, because otherwise looks, nobody can understand and we're about public visibility for the community. Um, 4.2, deputations and petitions. We don't have any that I know about. Number five, we've got urgent business. Have we got any extraordinary and urgent business? No. Um, notices of motion. We have a notice of motion that we've received. Um, that, that is moved by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Where is the notice of motion? Where, have we got it up on the screen? Where is it? Uh, the notice of motion, if we can get it up on the screen, that'd be good. Um, that Council re requests staff to investigate how a cooperative initiative with Predator Free 2050 to make fully automated set and forget possum traps available to all Canterbury households might work. Well, that's an investigation into how it might work. I'm sorry, I read it a bit wrong. With an estimate of the likely effectiveness on predator reduction and potential costs, report back to Council for consideration in the lead up to the next annual plan and that might be the, the um, long-term plan too, I guess, but we can think about that. So that's moved by Councillor Elizabeth Kenzie. Have we got a second for that resolution? Councillor Clear, uh, Phil Clearwater is seconding it. Okay, so would you like to um, speak to that, Councillor McKenzie? Um, yes, yes. Um, so... Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So the reason I've um, uh, made this motion is um, because of the potential that I see in some of the new technology that's coming through with trapping. Um, the potential to actually have um, every household in Canterbury to actually have one of these traps. Um, and why they are so effective is, is that they actually do trap a wide range of predators. So now the reason I've written the rush and the rationale I have focused on possums is basically um, because of a technicality. And that is that our Canterbury Regional Council Pest Management Plan has a list of pests which um, we have a statutory obligation to control. Now, it was written in 2013, and back then the focus was on uh, production, um, pr predominantly on production pests. And so the number of pests that relate to biodiversity is actually quite small. Um, and so hence the reason for, for focusing on possums and the rationale. Um, however, these traps will get possums, stoats, weasels, ferrets, rats, um, and feral cats. Um, and so the big advantage with this sort of technology is that you can leave it for around six months. You don't have to monitor the trap. Um, it's very safe because the trap actually turns off an hour after 
nightfall and it turns back on. Uh, sorry, it turns yeah, it turns on an hour after nightfall and turns off an hour before dawn. And so you're not going to get um, issues with children um, or people interfering with the tracks. Um, and so um, currently, you know, this kind of technology is being used by the Department of Conservation, and um, it's it's very effective, particularly in, in remote areas. Um, but I, I do see a lot of potential for this to actually be used in um, throughout New Zealand. Now, last year there was a study that actually showed that residential areas and rural residential areas are refuges for uh, pests like possums. Um, and they will spread from these areas back into areas that have been cleared by, for example, the Department of Conservation. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're going around clearing one area of pests but not actually having a program throughout the whole country, then um, you're really, you know, it's a bit like with Wallaby, you're kind of wasting your time because they'll just move to, to another area. Um, the other, the other thing is also is with the new trapping technology that's available, um, you, you don't have to use poisonous baits. Now, um, poisonous baits for, for example, rats are becoming a problem in the environment because they're actually building up and people are detecting them in their, um, in their pets like dogs. They're actually detecting them in their blood um, from these, you know, anticoagulant type um, baits. So um, I'm just wondering if there's anything else I need to cover. Um, so I think I've pretty much covered, uh, the only other thing I would say is that at the moment there are only a few companies with this kind of technology. This is because New Zealand is actually the only country in the world that actually has a, a, a unique kind of situation where we do a lot of um, poisoning and trapping of predators. Um, and so but I do think in future that this, this kind of thing is, is going to be very ad advantageous. So I think it's an opportunity that it would be good to investigate um, with the possibility of, of having some sort of, um, I mean, it could be a subsidy, but it might be some other thing that, that just makes it easier for people to access. Um, it might just even be raising awareness um, of, of the um, advantage of this. The, the main impact is that also around areas which you want to protect for um, forest regeneration is if you're if you've got this kind of trapping occurring, you're protecting your birds and those are the things which actually regenerate your forest. They spread your forests. Um, if we lose our birds, um, then we're losing a mechanism for actually um, increasing um, our forests. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, on this. Thank you. Um, I didn't have questions. If anyone wants any questions, they can raise them. Um, who else would like to speak? Um, is there anybody else? Oh, Phil, you're the seconder. Do you want to speak? Go up. Yes. Council, I've been happy to support Elizabeth's um, notice of motion. I think it's really important that we as a council do everything possible, not only to keep up with technology, and Doc have you know, clearly got some good examples, just how we, so to me, this is part of how we actually work in partnership with, with other groups. And I think we're well aware, and I think Elizabeth has put the case very, very well about the importance of actually, you know, being proactive and, um, you know, attending to every po every possible sort of intervention that we can do in this whole area of um, biodiversity, which, as we know, is at, at pretty severe risk right now. So I certainly um, support this notice in motion. Councillor Phil Clearwater. Thank you. Um, so, is anybody else wanting to support talk to this resolution? Councillor Claire Mackay, you're first, and then Councillor John. Thanks very much. Um, look, I, to a degree, I support the intent um, that Councillor Mackenzie's brought to the table around pest control, um, particularly for biodiversity um, aspects, uh, and the fact that staff could investigate that for a future council table or future discussions in an annual plan or long-term plan. I'm having some difficulty with the specificity of the motion that's on the table um, around both uh, the cooperative initiative and the relationship with the predator-free, for example, um, the specificity of possums, 
and the specificity around all Canterbury households because we know that possums uh, will travel in a little area. So definitely it could be uh, more area focused. But um, yeah, so I, I would like to have seen a motion that was more broad spectrum. Uh, Liz, I, I'm oh, sorry, I have to, I have um, expressed my views to Council McKenzie, but I think that um, to incorporate what I would like to see there would almost be a rewrite, and it's probably not fair to, to put that on the table at this stage. Well, you'll have to answer that in the debate, Liz, Liz I think. Uh, that's the way to handle this. Councillor John Sunkle. We just yes, speak in support of it, um, given that it's an investigation. Uh, period 3, 2050 is a national initiative, and we are investigating, so I'm happy to, to support. Uh, uh, the... uh, kia ora koutou. Um, tēnākoe, Elizabeth. Uh, Thanks so much for bringing this to us. I think that it's um, a really great idea, so um, congratulate you for doing the background research and bringing this to us. Um, I was at a meeting last night um, where we had uh, Hugh Wilson there. Some people may know Hugh, the only fools and dreamers do. Um, bit of a legend on Banks Peninsula in terms of um, uh, biodiversity restoration. And um, out of the discussion after his um, his corridor was three things came out that were really important. Obviously, protection of remnants is, is really important. Um, and then he advocates for natural regeneration, of course. Um, but there was agreement, and this is also something they do at Hinewise, pest control was uh, vital to natural regeneration and restoration, of course. And then planting and restoration was the third thing. So, um, you know, totally support um, what you are trying to do here to get more... Um, you know, more hit across the region. I think that's a really good thing. And like John, because it's an investigation, I think the things that um, Claire said about the specificity can actually be um, found out through that investigation. So, yeah, I really support this and think that um, let's have a look at it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pauling. Uh, Councillor Ian, uh, oh, Councillor Peter Scott. Yes, sorry, Peter. I know. Uh, no, thank you. Look, I. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also uh, support the intent around this, but I think it's a bit clumsy. Um, I think that um, you know we've got three hundred thousand households in Canterbury. Uh, the cost of twenty dollars a trap is six million, so it's a big impost um, <clears throat> if you look at it that way. So I think that um, an opportunity to investigate this is probably a good idea. Um, um, you know, fringe. We know that on some of the fringe areas around the towns where we do get these um, possums and things coming down out of the bush are the areas. But I'm just wondering how many people down Rickerton Road would need one of these. Or you know, um, so I, I, I'm not against this at all. But I just think that we need to be doing a little bit more work on this. Thank you, uh, Councillor um, Peter Scott, Councillor Ian McKenzie, and then Councillor Vicky Southworth. So over to you, Ian. If, look, if I could just make, uh, ask Liz a question first, and then I want to make a comment. But you can ask a question. Yeah. Um, well, I guess that's for staff to work out, um, because you know the degree of cooperation um, will be something that staff will come back and advise us about. Cooperating um, with uh, the predatory. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it would seem that that would be the logical people to cooperate with. But, you know, if, if for some reason that entity changes or disappears, then it might be with the Department of Conservation. I guess, I guess that's. Um, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I don't sort of want to tell staff exactly how to do anything. Um, but I presume that we will need to cooperate. All right, that's good. Um, Ian, do you want to speak? Well, then I guess uh, look, I'm I, and um, I, I uh, I'm I like the concept of taking on, you know, being part of the, the predator-free initiative, uh, but I'm um, slightly concerned that if we were to go ahead with providing traps to everybody, 
um, anybody with a cat is going to be slightly upset because uh, I know people keep talking about feral cats, but in fact, there's no difference in the countryside between a feral cat and a, and a non-feral cat. They're all bloody cats. And and these traps, especially set and forget traps, will actually kill all cats, which is, I think, a good thing for predator-free New Zealand. But some people I've, I've noticed within New Zealand have a slight issue about it. So. Um, I, I, I'm con I guess I'm a little bit concerned. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a great fan of controlling predators. Don't get me wrong. And I like the fact that this is investigating. But I think, um, like Peter and Claire have said, I've got some reservations about some of the implications of what this, pro this is proposing. Hey, thank you. We'll just give you a right of reply in a minute, um, Elizabeth. Uh, who else we got? Councillor Vicky Southworth, you, you can go next. Got thank you. Um, yeah, I support the intent of this and and will support the motion. Um, I do note some of the and, and agree with um, some of the comments. The cat comment. I was also going to ask a question about that. I've had a owned a cat in the past. I don't anymore. Um, but I've owned a cat in the past that would certainly. I'm quite sure would would have a good lick of a bit of mayonnaise given half a chance. Um, so so I think. But I think that the despite that yes, it's very specific here, but I think any staff investigation would actually look beyond that specifics and look at the, you know, a, a, a range of trap options, a range of where the primary focus needs to be, how to make sure it's a cost effective proposal. And so I don't have a problem with the specifics because because that is what an investigation would do, would look more, like, you know, a bit more broadly. Um, so I, I'm in support and I think it's a great idea. And and the, the amount of money spent on restoring sites, planting trees and all those sorts of things, to have them just chomped away, you know, that it makes no sense at all. So any any initiative that can really help to to give all of these plants and our birds the best opportunity to to thrive, I think is it's really worth investigating. So thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Councillor Southworth, and we could hear you well from what looks like your vehicle in the wet weather. Yeah. Uh, is anybody else wanting to speak? Um, all right, I'm going to say I'd like to. Oh, are you speaking, or you've had a turn? Can I just have a question of clarification? Because Vicky raised um, I, I sort of. I, I'm not sure if I explained it clearly, but if if how how if this motion is quite specific about what we're asking staff to do. But in fact, what we want staff to do is come back with the recommendations and report on, on what. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, um, that's all right. I can address that and what I'm going to say, actually. I've got it written down. Uh, and um, so I'd like to say, I'd like to speak in support of this um, resolution. And I'd really like to congratulate Elizabeth for taking the initiative and bringing it forward. Um, I have a different view of the specifications in there. I think that enables a very wide interpretation by staff. And I know that staff will want to do an excellent job and they'll work through the CEO and they'll come back and deliver a report with a number of options in it. So I, so I think it gives that scope to staff to totally explore that and investigate it and see how it fits in with their programs. We have to remember that we're putting a substantial amount of our money into Predator Free Banks Peninsula. I just I just can't remember how much it is, but two thousand, three, three thousand um, bucks altogether, or oh, three, three million, I think, over about five years. It seems irrational to me to be investing that money in Banks Peninsula, which is not an island off the coast of Christchurch or the South Island. So we ne desperately need, if that we're going to get the traction out of that for the future, to have every person in Christchurch or have a trap in their backyard and to answer some people that don't think they're in Christchurch, they're in Spencer Road and Turner's Road in Marshlands. And I regularly have possums, um, a possum man and at the pony club down the road coming to kill dozens of possums. He got 60 the other night from some old wrecked cars in, a, in a, a place on Marshlands Road. I also have cats, but I'm still in favour of it. I think it's really good that um, Elizabeth's done this research. I think it's really excellent. It's a great rationale and we can move towards the LTP. It gives lots of flexibility for staff to indeed come back and I like the focus on um, possums in, in terms of dive by, dive by, dive biodiversity and um, I just think it's really good. So the other thing I'd like to finish off with, this is a great behaviour change mechanism because you know us Kiwis love a discount. 
So if we could get it, just look what's happened with electric cars. The uptake of electric cars for a mere 8,000 bucks has really encouraged people to be buying electric cars. So I'm sure people will, if, and it also means we can advertise it. And, and I'm looking forward to what staff might come back with. So I think it's really good. So I totally support it. So thank you, Elizabeth. Do you want to speak in reply or not? I'd like to address some other things that were raised. When's the appropriate time to do that? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so there were a couple of things that were just um, that were raised. Um, firstly, I'll just deal with the issue that uh, Councillor Southworth and Councillor McKenzie raised about domestic cats. Now, if you read the rationale carefully, you will see that it actually mentions that the bait is not attractive to domestic cats. So it isn't mayonnaise from your, the four square. Um, it is mayonnaise with something else in it, um, presumably some sort of thing that domestic cats find distasteful. But the research thus far has been that uh, domestic cats um, are not attracted to these, uh, have not been killed with these traps. Um, the other thing is also is that they, they are less likely simply because of the timing that the traps turn themselves off. Um, so um, a couple of issues that Peter, uh, sorry, that Councillor Scott raised, um, uh, saying that Rickerton Road uh, does, doesn't have a major problem. Actually, on Rickerton Road, there's an area called Dean's Bush, and it's got a major problem with rats, ferrets, stoats, weasels, possums, those sorts of things. They've actually had a major um, uh, program there just recently. So I'm afraid, you know, our urban, <laughs> our urban areas... <laughs> Our urban areas do do actually have um, have these pests, um, and in terms of cost, you know, say say it was um, what Councillor Scott suggested, twenty dollars per trap is six million. Well, um, how about measuring the impact of what you're going to lose, and how about actually looking at the cost of what we're doing with wildland pine and wallaby, you know? And I mean, this is not something that um, Environment Canterbury do on their own. This would be with the help of government. So, um, yeah, that's just to address those, those things. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. So we'll put this vote. Um, the motion is on the board. I won't read it out again. So I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Aye. Then, who's that? Who's, oh, she's saying aye. 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 Yeah, all right, that's carried. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Very good work. That's excellent work. And we've got everybody around the table pretty much agreeing. So that's good. Right, we're moving on now. And I, I just like to say I'm looking forward to working with staff and their timing that will come through the CEOs. And um, I think it's an exciting development. Right, we're on to number seven now on page um, of, uh, six of your agenda of 79 on the one that you should have. If you, it's on page six. Um, anybody got any issues with these minutes? Oh, these are your are these your minutes? No, these are the um the council minutes. Anybody got anything that they want to raise about these minutes? Uh, Liz. Cap yeah, I just want to clarify something. I'm I'm recorded for those minutes as being a partial absence, but that's because I was in Fairly and not here. But I was actually at the meeting, if you oh, recall. You yeah. There were, yeah, yeah. There, I was, I was absent for a part, a part of, of of the meeting, but it was just a small part. So, yeah. Sorry. Ah, uh, sorry. I I left the meeting um following the deputation. Uh, by um the, on the Kapahu River, and rejoined the meeting. It would have been ten minutes after that. Is it? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll speak to the report on page 44 of 79. Uh, there is one item here recognizing that we had um, uh, the Kakahu residents regarding the Kakahu River um, and that we did thank them at the time, highlighting to councillors that you have an upcoming briefing on this matter. And once that briefing has been concluded, we will go back to the residents. That is all from the report, Chair. Anybody have any questions about that, Councillor Phil, Phil Clearwater? 
Thank you, Stephanie. Given timing issues recently, I'm just wondering if we could have a tentative date for when we might have that briefing. It's next Tuesday. Well, we have an updated resolution. Oh, sorry, keep going. Um, Councillor Ian, have you got... Well, well just a question, really. I, it talks about representing the Kakahu residents. Kakahu residents. Um, there's quite a lot of people who live in the Kakahu community who would say that these residents don't represent the Kakahu residents. They rep they were they are some they are Kakahu residents, but they don't necessarily represent the Kakahu com community. Okay, okay, yeah, they, it's actually getting reworded. This resolution. Um, we actually haven't got it up on the screen, but it still says notes. It contains the outcome of a public forum presentation, thanking Ms. Anne Smiley, Mr. Um, Nelson and Ms. Anne, representing the Kakapu residents for their presentation. They're really representing themselves, I thought, although what did they say? They don't represent the Kakapu. No, they were representing themselves. My recollection is they said that they were representing the residents, and I, I think that Councillor Kai's suggestion of some residents, because that's what they said, yeah. and it's not a big deal. Buttons. Are uh, representing some, some Kākāhu residents. Um, that was... Um, so we'll change it to Ms. Anne Morrison representing some Kākāhu residents for their presentation and their notes. It should say notes, staff, or it should say notes that these are formal writing that staff are to prepare or staff are preparing. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, staff to prepare, it's sort of like a note, but make it good English, to prepare a briefing to council on the situation regarding the Kākāhu River and we'll update the public forum presenters following that briefing. So thank you, Stephanie. We'll just put the word some in there. Does that suit everybody? Yes. I just wonder if a better word would be um, Morrison as Kākāhu residents regarding the Kākāhu River. Because if you're putting in some, it sounds a little bit odd. I'm reading it. A bit, um, I think Claire's got a good idea. So can we just? I'll I'll just amend that resolution on the board to saying Morrison and get rid of deletes representing that and say as. Kākāhu residents. It's a good idea. So I'm moving that as an amendment. I don't know that we need to treat it as an amendment. We'll just say I did that from the chair um, and everybody agree. You don't need to even write that. We'll just do it. Uh, all right, so who's going to move this resolution? Moved by Councillor Peter, um, Peter Scott, seconded by Councillor Elizabeth uh, McKenzie. All those in favour, please say aye. Um, I think that's carried. Anybody against? There not being anybody against. That's carried. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you to everybody for um, the work on that. We're up to 8.3 now, which is on page 53. Or is it 8.2 on page 46? This is over to you. Um, I think you're going to speak to this, Councillor Sunkel. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, matters the uh, Audit, Finance and Risk Committee meeting of uh, 23rd of June. I draw your attention to item 8.5. Um, Matters prior to that were our standard uh, reporting. Um, a conversation in the COVID-19 recovery projects uh, revolved around our reporting, and our reporting as council tends to be year to year, date on date. Um, these projects run over actual dates. So a question of how we might in, in the future look at our reporting for, for projects that run over the, the financial year and the like, and, and a conversation there. And also a conversation around um, expenditure to date. And, and whilst we might put a, a green stamp on and say everything's up to date and we've spent 80% of our um, expenditure, which we're, we're looking for an understanding of what it will take to complete a project as opposed to what we've spent in a, in a project. So just developing some business case and study and some thinking around uh, where we ultimately end up to ensure that 
uh, when we've spent all the money allocated, we still don't have something left to, to physically do to finish projects. So ongoing conversations is around business cases and the like that uh, we are seeking assurances for. And again, on item uh, 8.6, public transport performance, uh, we had a, a, a more a deeper dive rather than just our, our normal reporting with Stuart Gibbon, um, I guess, presenting and providing some of the, the significant challenges that we face in, in the near future uh, around public transport um, and all those issues that we are we are aware of, but we had the opportunity to, to have a deeper dive and, and conversation. I'm not sure whether Giles has any comment on any of the other matters in the paper as director. None. Uh, any questions? No. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Sunkel. Uh, would you like to move this resolution? Moved by Councillor John Sunkel, seconded by Councillor Grant Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. Is there anybody opposed? Not being anybody opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we're up to pay, um, 8.3 now, which is on page 53. This is the Council Resolutions Report. Um, um, Councillor Scott, are you looking like you've got a question? Are oh, you going to move it? Okay. Is there any other anybody else wanting to ask anything? Or Councillor Scott's moved it. No, nobody's got any issues or anything they'd like to raise or check up on. All right. Who would like to second it? Councillor Claire Mackay is seconding it. Don't think you need to speak to it. All those in favour, please say aye. Are uh, there being nobody opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. We're on to item 8.4 now, which is on page 72 of the agenda. Um, this is a, a, a report about what's going to happen around some procedures uh, for the meeting schedules for the rest of the year. Has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask about that? I think we might have cleared them all up, did we? Councillor, anybody got any questions? Oh, Councillor McKenzie? Well, it seems to me that um, I'm a bit nervous. That I, mean, I understand the uh, purpose of this and that, and that there is a process that we need to fill. Um, I'm a little nervous. My instincts tell me that um, we've been getting advice from Sir Humphrey, from Yes Minister, in terms of how to uh, uh, dilute the uh, input from the elected uh, councillors and, and give all power to the executive, which has its merits. I, I understand that. But I wonder whether, in fact, a draft, uh, my question really is, is whether we could have a draft schedule of committee meetings uh, that, that goes into the schedule of um, appointments for the new council, uh, which might then expedite them setting up uh, a schedule of committees rather than just leaving a blank space for them. So I understand that's what will be happening. That will be presented to the meeting at that time. Uh, that's how it happens. And I've watched every uh, every uh, every single yes minister and yes prime minister, and it's nothing like that, I can assure you. So, okay, Catherine Checky, would you like to come to the table, please? I suggest people should watch it, actually, because it's very instructive for anybody, and it's very funny of anybody, I think particularly, or maybe all the executive team would like to watch it as well if they haven't. It's very exciting watching. Okay, it's Catherine Shecky. Kia ora Kato and, and Catherine Em sends her apologies. Um, she's obviously greeting our our, um, our guest who's, who's recently arrived. Um, absolutely, so it might be worth giving you a little background and, and forgive me if, if this is already um, information you know, the LGA says that all of the council's committees are deemed to be dissolved on the election. And while the council has the right to resolve that certain committees carry on, and that's a paper that will come to you at your next meeting, that's the starting point. Committees are, are dissolved. And so it will be for the new council to establish which committees it wants to have, who's on them, what their terms of reference are, and what their meetings are. It is absolutely... Um, the chief executives and the governance team's intention to bring to one of the very first business meetings of the new council a proposal around which committees the new council should have, what those terms of reference are, and who should be on them, how many councillors should be on them. Obviously, the people who are on them is, is 
for the new council's decision and what the dates will be. So that will very much be part of the, the work programme for those very early meetings. Thank you, Catherine. I'd just also like to add that at the start of each term, the chair usually talks to all the new councillors, and it's often at the chair's instant, well, it normally is, if you go on the training, LGMZ training, they tell you it's at the chair's instigation um, what, and, and with, in, co in discussion with all the councillors around the committees uh, and who um, chairs them. We've got co-chairs here, so I don't see any reason why um, but it's very much in the ability of the chair to lead that, and it's part of the leading ro leadership role of the council. Um, I could send around the um, leadership training I got from LGNZ, so you can all see that for the new term. Um, and I think, Catherine, you can be rest assured that Catherine uh, McMillan has um, done this um, very deliberately following the processes on the advice of Catherine, who's at the table, and making sure I'm clear about it too and it's the way it should happen. Councillor Phil Clearwater. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Catherine, for clarifying this, because I guess this is a first time for this council to have had this change, But and I can sort of understand some of the nervousness, but you've made it really clear that, in fact, this is, under the Local Government Act, this is the democratic process, and that, in fact, this council doesn't prescribe um, the format, of like committee format for, for the new council coming, and that the CE will make that proposal. And I, I think it's a really clear, good process, and um, my, in my experience, it, fo it follows um, good process of other councils too. Clearly, the CE will work with the new chair and staff around that, and there will be those discussions. Um, uh, actually, this can cause huge strife, and actually, blow ca councils can get into terrible strife right from the start of this term. And I'm speaking from experience. If this isn't done really well, and it was actually a discussion that I had with several. Um, people running for mayors, um, mayors and chair, actually chairs positions at the reg regional, uh, the national council this time round. So you need the protection of the staff and their advice around this. Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Just got a question. Does this also apply to the Te Rōpū Tuia meeting schedule? And how how is that viewed? Because there's sort of you know this constant break every three years. And yet we sort of need continuity in certain areas. How, how does that work? Te Rupo Tuia is not a committee of the council and it's governed by the Tuia agreement, which of course does endure across terms. So it sits outside of the LGA requirements around dissolution of, of committees at the election. The truth of the matter is with that one, um, you'll notice that um, some people in the partnership change during the term because it's not coordinated with all the Papatipu Runanga elections. So it actually needs to be a bit more flexible. But Appendix 7 of the LGA does also enable um, two-year arrangements that we've got here, they could be more formalised, like, for example, the meeting between the City Council and the, um, the and our Council, and the previous Council prior to the dissolution of this Council, and if you don't, if you've got strange, I think I've gone a bit strange, you can look on the web and you can find that it was a formal committee of the Council and the City Council, and they had this Council Secretary there, and everything they did was recorded in a public meeting which actually provides a level of protection to all councillors and staff and gets um, things on the transparent public record. If you'd like to revisit the archives online, you'll find the minutes there. Um, so there are some interesting developments like that around democracy and visibility that could still happen um, with what the arrangements we do at the moment. All right. Any up? Oh, John, Councillor Sunkel has a question. Yeah. I understand what, what the rules are. Uh, I have potential candidates asking me, so, so what is the process, what are the meeting? what is the time? And I, all I can say is this is what we do now. I cannot tell you what the future looks like. And they all, I've got a busy life and a busy world. I would like an idea of what I am committing to. I'm just... Okay, Thank you very much, John, and I can understand why people say that because it's very difficult to understand it. But our council has provided education systems 
uh, that Catherine's been delivering education systems here for people. So if there's any can possible candidates that want us to run, they can come along and ask Catherine all those questions. So I really, I really recommend that for any candidates. They're very good. So um, Peter, did you have a question? Just regarding um, <clears throat> post the election, uh, my understanding is that the CEO calls the first meeting. So this schedule here looks about the first yeah. council meeting after the initial meeting that you called, Stephanie. Yeah, I can tell you that Catherine's been all through that and she's got it really well worked out. Not this Catherine, the other Catherine. Yeah. So, John, did I cut you off? Is that your issue? Oh, you seem to be getting annoyed. That's why I was, that was why I was by my body language. Yes, I, and I say I accept, so I being, accept the rules that we yeah, if you want to. Yeah. Councillor Sunkel, if I might, um, there is also with regard to election 2022 and a responsibility for uh, myself and the council to be able to provide a, an election report. Uh, that report within it highlights the key things that are upcoming in the next triennium. Uh, it also highlights some of the processes and on average, the amount of time spent and to date the types of days that we have or haven't worked. And it's that kind of information that is provided to any who wish to consider standing, let alone who do stand. So I can reassure you in that context, although not in this paper, it is a separate matter and people can be informed in that way. And actually, if you um, want to read the uh, Act, it was changed um, some time ago now, and it actually says the CEO has a broader role in fostering people to stand and fostering democracy than actually has been done in practicality by most CEOs in New Zealand. So our CEO, with Catherine McMillan's assistance, is running a, a, a more extensive education programme this time round. So I think that to be congratulated. Uh, Councillor Clare, would you like to speak? It's just a question of clarity from the CEO about the report that you've mentioned. Uh, the booklet talks about that being on the website by the end of this month. Is that likely to be? Because somebody has asked me about that as well. Yes, Councillor Mackay, that is in tow. Yes. Is it appropriate to move? Is it appropriate just to move this now, uh, Chair? I will. Yes. I hate these things. It should be voice activated. But anyway, that's for the future. Maybe I can move a resolution about let's get let's get voice activated non-free microphones for all councillors. Anyway, sorry, I can't help it. I have to stop saying jokes in the middle of the meeting. Um, um, well, I forget what I was saying now. But anyway, look, Catherine has taken advice around this because sometimes after the election, the councillors feel a bit pushed around because you get you get a lot of staff straight away. So I'm sort of saying what John was saying in a way, because that happens when you get here for new people anyway. But you need to try and make it a little bit of time in there, and Catherine's tried to get that just right. So if it's not right for you, then next time round, at the end of next term, you can work with the governance manager, whoever it is, and the CEO to get it right for the next term, because it's pretty blooming hard to get right, I can tell you. Okay, yeah, thank you all. Um, all right. Yeah, all right. We'll go to the 12.30 item now, and that is to bring in um, uh, our former employee, Ian Hisclop, and I feel like I should stand up and go and greet him, so we'll just do it like this. Um, so how are we doing? I'll just, I've just, just messaged Catherine. Yeah, so just hang on a minute. All right. Well, we'll make a start. I'm just going to remove my mask, and I see uh, you have two, um, Ian. Um, just while we talk, just so we can talk properly. Um, I hope you don't mind. But thank you for wearing the mask. So, so welcome, Ian. It's a real pleasure to have have you coming back here to um, talk with us. Um, and we've been trying to do it for a while, but with COVID and various things, um, but we finally got around to it. 
Um, before Ian left, um, I had uh, quite a bit of contact with Ian and I went. one thing that I, we did was go on a bus tour after the flooding last year and it was real um, fantastic to have him there uh, telling me all sorts of interesting things about what was going on in the rivers and what was and wasn't happening with the flooding. So I was really uh, privileged to be able to do that. And earlier in this term, I had the privilege of going to Auckland to a rather flash event, and we all got dressed <laughs> up, and uh, you looked absolutely wonderful, I have to say, and we um, got an award, and it was an award around um, the work that you did on the Waimakariri flood protection. So, um, you know, uh, working right through that earthquake period, um, you helped keep it going with the contractors, which was really um, financially um, and um, risk-wise a fantastic thing to do, but I know how hard it would have been through the earthquakes because it, all work in Christchurch was very difficult during that time. But um, you got a lot of praise from contractors for actually actually keeping that going. And also um, in how you dealt with the contractors. I think that's one of the things that was mentioned in that national award. You know, it's a very difficult job to be coordinating such a secondary flood bank construction over not to mention having to deal with your own earthquake situation and 21,000 bumps or aftershocks or whatever or what's we got. So I know that my experience of working with you is just a fraction of what you've contributed to Canterbury overall. For most half your career, you were here. Uh, and I just think we're just so lucky to have had that experience. And you also gave me a reminder that um, during my life and your life, um, we had a different way of training river engineers um, in a national program. And since that you have left, uh, we as a regional sector have made a, pro a, a proposal to government around investing $150 million into the river systems in New Zealand. And in that report, you'll find that that is mentioned because I think that was one thing you gave me a reminder about. You know, there is no place for young water river engineers to get that experience on a national level. And that's indeed what was happened with the Ministry of Works. So I just love my experience talking with you and I'm, I'm sorry that um, you've left, but I think it's very wise. Um, you'll find that I'm leaving myself at the end of this term too, which I think is um, another wise move from my personally. But it's also about that loss of corporate memory um, that 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 um, we're sad to not have you here. And I've also got a special mention here of your high level of integrity. So that is a wonderful badge of honour, I think, to actually wear that into retirement and have us acknowledging that. So we want to sincerely, sincerely thank you for your commitment, and it's really good that you've brought your family in today. So I think I'm now going to ask you if you'd like to say a few words. Yes, yes, I would. Uh, th thank you for that, um, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, th thanks for the vote of appreciation from from the council and from the from the senior staff. That's very much appreciated. And um, personally, I, I see that that is uh, recognition that river engineering as a profession is doing an, an important job, um, and also the river engineering team within ECAN which is an exceptional team, um, has done and will continue to do good work. Um, river engineering is very much a sort of an intergenerational thing where you know, each generation of engineers is, is building another layer and another layer and another layer of, of uh, flood protection and river management on what's there before uh, for the benefit of the community. And um, so I've, my, my career has been been 40 years or so. It um, kicked off when I um, went up went up to Gisborne from from Canterbury with a with a brand new Bachelor of Agricultural Engineering, and uh, went up to do, up there to work for the East Cape Catchment Board. So so um, spent five years there and another five years in the Hawke's Bay, based in Napier, working for the um, Hawke's Bay Catchment Board. And in those 10 years or so, I learnt a great deal and um, I think we do benefit a lot by ex exposing ourselves to different organisations, different environments, different communities and different rivers because every single river and every single catchment in New Zealand has a different character really and um, 
you know, if you just work on one particular river or one particular area, you can come, become a wee bit fixated on what's worked in the past or work in the future. I think having that broad experience is very important. And also working with a variety of different people and learning learning from them because I had some wonderful um, mentoring and guidance in those early years when I knew very little and then just quietly built up some knowledge and experience. So um, in 1989, 1990, we of course had uh, a situation where the old NOASCO, National Water and Soil Conservation Authority, and the Ministry of Works Water and Soil Directorate, which sort of supported that, that's those organisations were there at the central government level to provide uh, funding and technical support, really, for the catchment boards. And um, in 1989, um, that was withdrawn, and the regional councils were set up and brought other functions into into those councils. And at that point, we lost the um, national funding towards our catchment works and our rural works and our rural drainage works as well. And that was a huge loss. And um, also we lost a stream of, of um, training, a, tra a training path. Uh, um, really all that skill and expertise was sort of cut off at that point. So um, I think having seen that and then seeing how things have rolled on since then with um, having to sort of recover from the uh, lack of national funding support and, and um, fund things ourselves and so forth, we've seen um, flood protection sort of suffer quite a bit in the sense that we've just been in a position of maintaining what we've got rather than necessarily improving a great deal on it. And um, so now, uh, to some extent, the, big, the bigger councils such as Canterbury with Christchurch and a good funding base have been able to embark on some bigger projects, but little councils such as the West Coast have really suffered. Um, I think with climate change and so forth, we've got enormous challenges ahead of us. And the sooner we can get back to some sort of co-funding model that involves the government and has a pool of shared expertise uh, and so forth, um, the better. And I'm glad to hear that we're moving in that direction. Um, so I'll be looking forward to seeing how that evolves. And um, I think in the meantime, we've just got to take on young engineers and 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 people with other schools as well, the planning schools, the, the um, biodiversity and environmental management schools, they're all part of river engineering now in the broader sense. So we've got to bring those people on board and get them working as teams and, and to give them a good career path and keep them engaged. And if they disappear to another council, you say to them, well, go away, get some experience, you're welcome back, rather than you leave here. We're not having it back. Exactly. I've heard that before. Um, so, so um, yeah. So, really, it it is a it is a, a very challenging sort of career, but it's a very re rewarding career as well. And I think my highlight in recent years was during the Ashburton floods, um, standing on the Ashburton town stock banks and seeing them operate to capacity and do exactly what we intended they should do. Uh, that was extremely rewarding, and I uh, thank Sean and and Lee for for keeping you on for long enough for, for that to happen. <laughs> thank you, Lee. Yeah. So that that's really all, all I need to say. I appreciate everything, and thank you. Oh, I have a certificate in my hand from Environment Canterbury for outstanding contribution award uh, presented to end his lot in recognition of his outstanding contribution and the impact of his work. On Canterbury communities over his long career. Okay. Yep. Hey, we need a we need, we need photo just so stay here. Oh, we'll take some more through the other room if that's okay. You want to take your bicycle? Oh, I'll take that. Yeah. Yeah. Take 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 <laughs> If you stand a bit closer to Gidget as well, that'd be great. Thanks. Thanks. Well done. So, so we'll just have you come into the back room now. Yeah, and we'll yeah. 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 Yeah
and have a photo together and then get the group photo. Yeah, I think sorry, Chair, could I just be pedantic and ask you to formally adjourn? Can I I um adjourn the meeting now until after lunch. Thank you. All right, well, the meeting is recommencing at the time decided by you. Um, we've got to have a resolution to move into public excluded. I'll move that we move into public excluded, except seconded by Councillor Peter Scott. All those in favour, please say aye. Ah, uh, that's carried. Thank you very much. Can we just make sure that anybody who's not supposed to be in the room is left, please? As per the resolution made in public excluded on the living wage accreditation, recommendation is being released to the public. I have to read this out now. Uh, living wage. I am pleased to announce that the Council has decided that the Canterbury Regional Council will seek to become an accredited living wage employer. Once accreditation is achieved from living wage Aotearoa, Canterbury Regional Council will be the first regional council to become an accredited employer. Becoming a living wage fully accredited employer means Canterbury Regional Council will pay all its employees at least the living wage. It also means that directly, indirectly paid workers employed by contractors delivering a service to the council on a regular and ongoing basis and on our premises or on premises we control uh, either on the current living wage or on milestones agreed as part of the contract. Living Wage Aotearoa has outlined the benefits of being a living wage employer. They say employers talk about having reduced staff turnover, a more productive work environment and increased business as a direct result of paying a living wage. Workers talk about spending more time with their families, feeling focused, less stressed and constantly being happier and more motivated in their workplaces. Staff will work with Living Wage Aotearoa, the Public Sector Association and the external contract providers on any steps necessary to achieve accreditation. So thank you all. We can congratulate ourselves. We're moving on now to the date of the next meeting, which will be held on the 18th of August, 2022. And I'd like to ask um, our Tumutaya, Yayan Cranwell, to close the meeting. Thank you very much, Yayan. Um, Right, <laughs> Tai Kiye. Yo.